Hi, and welcome to Hope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is Pastor Will with today's message. sisters, the relationship between man to man is a very unique, it's a human characteristic. We like relationships, we desire relationships. The next step to that is man's relationship to God and what is that like and what is that, what happens with that. And all of us who are here today have come to a position in life where we're saying we know that there is a God, we believe that there is a God, and we want to have a right relationship with that God. And there's two elements as far as God is concerned in our relationship. Number one, that He is the King of all the earth and we are sinners and we need Him. And with that, we come across this story where God has brought a battle to a Christian, a man who believes in God, a man who believes in the Messiah, a man who is seeking after the Lord, Jehoshaphat. He is king of the nation of Judah, and he has brought a battle to him and said, this is not your battle, and as we read it. But that has, that has elements and teachings for us, and I want to go through this passage again and make sure that we have a, a lot of understanding of what's going on because there is so much in this passage of Scripture it is at a time when Israel has been um, wrought with following after their own ways. And they've divided, and there's ten tribes to the north, and there's two tribes to the south. The tribes to the south, the two are Judah and Benjamin, and they are called the nation of Judah. Their king is Jehoshaphat. At this time, we have ten tribes that are to the north, and they have followed their own path, and they're doing their own thing. And they're not following after God. And so what transpired is because of that rebellion, God said to the nation of Israel in 722, I'm taking you away. In 722 uh, BC, the nation of Assyria came and took over the, the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, and brought them and displaced them, took them and put them in other nations. And then they brought other people from other nations and they intermixed with the, the ten northern tribes. And so today... You don't really have a lot of those tribes. You can't talk about the people who come from those ten tribes. They're basically dispersed out into the world. We don't know who they are. They don't even know if they're, they're, they may be part of that or not. But the two southern tribes still followed after the Lord. And they, after the 722 happened in B.C., what transpired is that they lived on seeking after God more because they had kings like Jehoshaphat. But in 586, they were also conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, by, the, uh, by Babylon. And they took those away. And God said, I'm going to take you away for 70 years. That's the group that went with Daniel. And Daniel left and went down to uh, Babylon as a young man. And he became a wise, uh, a wise man at that, uh, in, for King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a relationship. You can read the book of Daniel about that. They stayed there 70 years, and there were people who were saying, you know, you don't, we're never going to be able to go back. We're never going to be able to be brought back to the nation of Israel. So just forget about all of our religion. God said, don't do that. Follow after me. Serve me, and I will bring you back into the land. 70 years later, they come back into the land. One of the guys that brings them back to the land is a man by the name of Ezra. Ezra the priest, he wrote a book, Ezra. He also, there was another man that brought him back, uh, a third. There were three actually come, uh, coming back to the, the promised land. And uh, that was Nehemiah. And so Ezra comes back and he sees all of these individuals who have been dispersed out into Babylon, now coming back, and he wants to teach them about who God is. And so he writes the books of First and Second Chronicles. That's where we're at. And in those books, he is trying to relate to them what has transpired and why they went to their, their dispersion, why did they went to their captivity in Babylon, and why are they now back. And so he has written these two books, giving the history. And by the way, parents, let me encourage you. If you're the first Christian in your world, make sure your, your kids know that. But if you've got a, a father or a grandfather or a great-grandfather who were Christians, make sure your kids know that also. It's very, very important that they know that they're, just, they're, in, they're part of something that is bigger than who they are. And so that's what Ezra wanted to do. And he taught them who they were and who God was. And they teach them. And, uh, he taught them principles. 
He taught them about who God was in their lives and why they were uh, rebuked by God. And so we come to this story in Second Chronicles chapter 20, and he talks to and he tells the story about Jehoshaphat, who was a great king, a reformer king, one of four, honestly, a man who who uh, followed after the Lord. His father Asa. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But what it gives for us today is this. When the battle comes, how do you respond? How do you deal with God? When the battle comes, how do you deal with God? And we're going to be talking about it this week, and we'll talk about it next week, and then we'll be done with this passage of Scripture. But there are some important lessons I want you to get, and I want, you, I want it to be ground into your heart that there is a God, and that God draws you into battle. And your battle may be in vocation. You may be having a battle that God has brought to you, that you didn't even ask for, but it's there and you've got to fight it. There may be a battle in your marriage and you asked for that one and you said, I love her or I love him and things have not turned out like you have wanted them to be. You're in a battle. It may be in your family. You may have loved those children when they first uh, were born and they were infants and everything was wonderful and all of a sudden they get to be five and six and 10 and 20 and you're sitting there going, I don't know what, what happened? It had to be the bait that, that, that put all that... St- What's wrong with my kid? You may be in that battle, but there are all kinds of battles in your life. And if you don't have one right now, I'm going to promise you there are going to be battles in the future. As I said last year, or as I said last week, you're either coming from a battle, you're in the middle of a battle, or you're going into a battle. It's one of the three because we're all there. Okay? But the question that I want you to ask yourself is how do I respond to this battle? What do I do? How do I implement in my life in this battle? How do I work it out? What do I do? Well, the answers to that come right here. And the first one that we talked about uh, last week or uh, two weeks ago is the provocation of an enemy. God will ensure that you and I have enemies in our lives. Oh, that's really nice. That's part of it. That's part of it, right? It's part of living this way. We will have enemies in our lives. What do we do with them? Well, the second point that we'll, we'll go to is one that I want you to dig into because I, I started it last week and, and uh, did not feel by the, the Spirit of God that I had finished it. So we're going to look at it um, because the second thing that we have there is the prayer of a saint, the prayer of the saint. And that coincides with our third pillar as far as Hope Chapel is concerned, believing firmly in the power of prayer. And so you have, starting in verse 3, Jehoshaphat says he feared and he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast it talks about the fact that as he set himself to seek the Lord, that he starts to pray. And that's the thing that I want you to remember. But I want you to get this as we go into that, that prayer is a procedure and a pattern that I want you to learn. And there are four things, and you can see them in your notes, and I want you to get them, and I want you to hold on to them. This is just not a suggestion. I believe this is what God wants out of you when you get into the battle. And those four steps, when you go to prayer before God, those four things need to be in the first one that we talked about. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you three different passages where it's true. In other words, this is a pattern of prayer. This is a pattern of prayer. Remember in the New Testament where the disciples said to the Lord, teach us how to pray? We're getting a pattern to pray. When you are going into a battle, when you are struggling in your life, these four steps you want to remember, okay? And the first one is proclaim the greatness of God. Now, we're going to go to three different passages. As I mentioned, that I'm going to show you how all three passages say the exact same thing, and you'll see them, all right? So you're in Second Chronicles, and in chapter uh, 20, look at verse 6. He says, O Lord God of our fathers, Are you not the God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might? And no one else is able to withstand you. What is he doing? He is proclaiming the greatness of the God that he is is praying to. And as I said last week, it's this idea. It helps in uh, in the perspective of life because it deals with the very providence of God. And what I mean by that is this. When we focus on the small things of life, we become small and we think small. When we focus upon the great one in life who is God Almighty, it changes our perspective totally. When I think of and I'm worried about, you know what, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage this month. It's $1,200. I can't pay it this month. And all we do is focus upon $1,200. What tends to be the result? Depression, discouragement, fear, worry, all of that stuff. 
Will you take your eyes off of the $1,200 and you look to God and you say, you own the universe. What starts to happen? You think, do you really think that God is up in heaven going, I don't know what we're going to do about Will and the $1,200. No. Money, here's the thing I want you to write down on your notes. Money is a small matter to God. Okay, write that down. Money is a small matter to God. God doesn't worry about money. Anybody got a dollar bill that I can have I, I, for a moment, borrow? <laughs> I'm not going to keep it, but you got a dollar bill. Anybody got it? Everybody's reaching. I would pull mine, but I, there's nothing in there. All right, all right. Anybody got a dollar bill? Thanks, brother. You got five dollar bill. Do we have ten? Does anybody got ten? All right, all right. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. What is this made of? This is paper. Where did the paper come from? Trees. Who made the trees? So somewhere, some tree, some place, somehow, I'm assuming, was cut down by somebody. It was cut in strips. And through a process that I don't understand, all of a sudden the net result is we've got a piece of paper and then we say, that's worth $5. It's paper. It's paper. It's not even gold, right? And it's not backed by gold. You know it's backed by? The good faith of the American people. <laughs> true? That's true, all right? So this is simply paper. In fact, I could rip it, all right? didn't still here brother it i could rip it but you know what you take about 10 or 15 or 100 of these and all of a sudden wow we say power it's paper and we know the god of the universe who made the trees upon which what they got this from and we're going to say to god oh no i can't pay you say pastor that's i see what you're saying there but when I don't have the paper, and somebody's at, thanks, brother, and I and I'm at, and somebody's asking for it, pressure gets there. I'm telling you this: stop looking at the paper, and stop looking at the bill, and start looking at God. That's where your focus needs to be. God, honestly, it's not my mortgage. Yeah, it's not my mortgage, God. All right, I, I know I'm living in this house. But I'm here, and you, talk, you promised you'd take care of me. At, yes and no. Has God promised to take care of you? Okay. And God has, ta- I'm 58 years old, and God has never been unfaithful with me. Never. And yet, the next time a bill comes, what happens? I look at my, my checking account, and now it's not even paper. It's some lights on a screen that tells me this is how much you have or you don't have in your bank account. And you can... You can take money and and shoot it all over the world and it's just somebody says, okay, that's happened. Okay. But who's the God of the universe? He's in control of that. And the first thing, I, I just want this to be rammed into your heart and for you to get this. Focus on God in the battle. Focus on God in the battle. Now, you're in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to want you to turn to the middle book of the Bible. It's called the Book of Psalms, okay? Book of Psalms. And within the Book of Psalms are 150 psalms. And I want you to look at 145, number 145. Verse 1, And I will extol you, O God, O King, And I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your uh, works to another. And you shall declare their mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of your might and your awesome acts. And I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness question what's the topic of the first seven verses the greatness of our god right the greatness of our god he does the exact same things here 
that you'll see uh, Jehoshaphat does in Second Chronicles chapter 20. He focuses attention upon who God is. And that's a principle and that's a pattern. When you're in a battle, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you focus in on who God is. But he doesn't stop there. Okay? Look at verses um, uh, 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all His works. Now what is His focus? The goodness of God. So the second step in your prayer that I'm trying to get through today that you want to see, I think I listed all four of those on there, brother. But the first one is to proclaim the greatness of God and the second one is to remember the goodness of God. So the greatness of God and the goodness of God, that's where you want to go, all right? Proclaim the greatness of God and remember, remember the goodness of God. And that's what he does here in verses 8 and 9. And so he starts off with saying God is great. You ever heard this for a little child? God is great. What's this next one? God is good. And then it says, thanks for the food, right? Okay. But he, that is a principle. Those are good theology lessons for your children to learn. God is great. God is good. You start with that all the time. All right. What we do is jump right into asking. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask. I say, wait a second. Note who I am, God says. Proclaim the greatness of God and the goodness of God. And the third thing that we have there is acknowledge your own weakness and, le- uh, and need. Look at verses 14 to 16. And the Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who have bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you. And you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every... He, you know what his focus there is? We've got a lot of needs. And God, you've meeting all of them. You see that? So the first step is, God, I proclaim how great you are. The second step is, I remember all of the good things that you've done in the past. I remind myself on a regular basis of all the great things God has done in my life. And I do that for a very specific reason. That's why you have them noted in the Old Testament, because God wants you and I to remember how great He is and how good He is. And then... We acknowledge our weaknesses. We acknowledge, we acknowledge our needs before God. And that's what he says there in those verses. But then look at verses 17 to 21. The Lord is righteous in all of His ways, gracious in all of His works. The Lord is near to all that call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He also will hear their cries and save them. The Lord pre- preserves all who love Him. My mouth, verse 21, shall speak of praise of the Lord and all the flesh shall bless His holy name forever. You know what that person now says? So no matter what transpires, I am focusing on God. And that's the fourth point. And that fourth point is this. Choose to trust in God. It's a choice. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of where you're at. I choose. It is a choice. Because He is great. Because He has always been good to me. Because I am weak. I choose to trust in God. You see those four things? you got to get those. Those have got to be in your soul. Because God is great. And because He's always been good to me. And because He, as who He is, has shown Himself strong. And I am weak. I choose to trust in God. In God, it is a choice. It is a willful choice. And you can see it not only in this psalm, you can also turn turn from here to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. In fact, if you note these four things, you can see them all over the Old Testament and New Testament. Let's do it again. Psalm 86. These three, these four themes are there. He starts off, interestingly... He starts off, Bow down your ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am needy, I am poor and needy. What's he, what's he doing there? Is he proclaiming the greatness of God? Is he, pro, is he remembering the goodness of God? No, what's he, what's he, what has he done? He went straight to number three. You know, this guy is really in duck soup. This guy is in big trouble, all right? And so that is right there in his heart. He goes right out to God and he says, God, I am poor and needy. But look at, start, uh, turn to verse 8, and look what he does. Among the gods there is none like unto you, O Lord, 
Nor is there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are what? What does it say? For you are what? Okay, a little bit better. For you are what? You are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. What's he done? He's gone to that to proclaim the greatness of God. All right? Look at verses 5 and 7, 5 to 7. For you, Lord, are what? You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplication. And in the day of my trouble, I will call upon you and you will answer me. In those verses, he talks about the goodness of God. He's remembering the goodness of God. In those same verses also, <clears throat> and the one we read at the very beginning about him being needy, he, you, show, you see that this man says, I, I need to sh- share with my weakness with God. Now, does God know you're weak? Roger, God knows you're weak? Okay. Sure he does. So why am I telling him? Well, if you want to go that route, God knows everything, so why are you talking? You see what I'm saying? Because God wants to hear you say it. You know, my wife knows I'm weak. My wife knows I make mistakes. But there's a difference between her knowing that and me telling her that. You know what it requires out of me when I say I'm weak? Yeah. And when you're going to go before God, when you're going to go before God, you go as a humble person, right? What does the scripture say? Humble yourself in the sight of God and He will lift you up. What does God do to the, the proud? He resists them. They want any part of them. The proud do not, do not get into the presence of God. Look in verses 2 and 4 of, uh, of Psalm 86. Preserve my life for I am holy. You are my God, Savior, servant who trusts in you. See the fourth one? He has chosen to trust in the Lord. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. What's he done? He's chosen to trust in the Lord. You see the four points again? They're, they're, they're switched around. And sometimes when I go to God in prayer, I go straight there and say, I am so lousy, God. I am so wretched. That's a, those are the first words out of my mouth. Wait, wait, wait a second. Pastor said I got to start with the proclaiming of the man. My heart is on, my heart is out there. I am messed up, and I need to talk with God. And God, my heart is before. Okay, you don't want to. Okay, now Pastor said. Okay, here's the first step. Okay, God doesn't want that. God wants your heart. But I'm saying those four points. We're going to go to another passage of scripture. But those four points need to be in the in the pre- message between you and God. Somewhere in your prayer time with God. It may be toward the end. I was praying with a man that I highly, highly admire. And he went, he mixed all of those up, but he ended with the greatness of God. And he said, I have prayed all of these things because you are the only God. There is none like unto you. And he went on like that. Man, we're ready to worship here. See? So you proclaim the, glo- the greatness of God. You remember the goodness of God. You admit your own weakness and need. And you make the statement, I will trust in God. There have been times when my prayer started that way. I trust in you. Because the thing is so big and in front of me, I want to say upright, straightforward, I trust in you. In fact, you'll find psalmists also make the statement, I trust in you. And what's going to happen if people know that I'm trusting in you and I fall down? See that? What is that going to do for your holy name? The last one I want you to look at is back to Chronicles, okay? The left, back to 1 Chronicles. I want you to see a man who did this all the way through his life. I love David. I just absolutely love David. Chronicles, second, or 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29. Because David, man, I loved how he loved God. I mean, I just, I read it again this, this last week. I just, I love this guy. He comes out there and there's a, there is an army to the right and an army to the left and a big tall guy in the middle. And he goes all the way down there and, and this is a 14 or a 15 year old kid. And this guy is short and that guy is tall. And that guy has been, according to Saul, that guy has been fighting as long as David has been living. And David doesn't go out there and say, I, you know, I think I come out here, 
We have a little TTCA here. You know, he doesn't, you know what he says? You messed up. This is a 14-year-old kid. You messed up. You have defied the armies of the living God. And I'm going to cut your head off, and I'm going to throw you to the, the birds of the air. And they'll pick... David, why did he say that? Why did he say that? Because he was loyal to God. I love that heart of David. So David, at the latter part of his life, he's getting ready to die. He's putting together the temple. And here he praises the Lord because of all of the assembly. In chapter 29, you have the offerings that are being brought uh, together to build the temple. Now, just watch what, what happens here. Start in First uh, Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10. And David blessed the Lord before all the assembly and said this. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. What's he just done there? What's he talking about? The greatness of God, okay? Both riches, verse 12, and honor come from you. You reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. May I, may I suggest and encourage you, if you're struggling with what to say in prayer, memorize these verses and just reiterate them back to God. He will be very happy, I will tell you that. All right? Why? Because you're speaking the truth. And so he starts with proclaiming the greatness of God. Look at verse 13. Now therefore our God... Notice he's made it personal. In the first uh, three verses, it's all you, God, and now he's making it personal. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. You're our God. You're our God. And that's simply the statement of the goodness of God in his life. Why? Because God has made you his child. Is that a good and kind act of God? Amen. You're my God. God hears from me in the morning times when I'm walking with Him, and I say, you are God, you are the only God. And I'm out there by myself. It was freezing today, and I was out there, and I was saying, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. You're my God. Early will I seek you. And my God made all of those stars that are up there, and all of the trees that are, you made them all. You're my God. I want to talk to you about a little bit of, a couple of problems here. Small, teeny bit of it. In comparison to God's greatness and His goodness to us, what are our problems? Well, I'd really like to get that job. That's not a big deal for God. You know? God, I really would like for you to heal Jim's back and Jim's knee, other Jim's knee. I'd like you to do that. Is that a big deal for God? Well, I don't know. You know, I've. That's a big thing, Will. You're asking. It's not even almost a thought. Now, God may not do it, and God may make them suffer. It may be thorns in the flesh. I know both of them are. There are thorns in their flesh. I got thorns in the flesh. That, God, that men in the past have asked for years that I would be uh, healed of. Guess what God said? No. But could God? Sure. But why does God give us thorns in the flesh? To humble us, what? Yeah, to, 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 to humble us? For God gives grace? Now here, let me, let me, let me ask you a question. Because here's, here's where I've had to come. Do I want the grace that comes with a thorn in the flesh or the no grace and the no, no thorn? Right? I want the grace. Because maybe you get a little bit more, you know? This is really bad, God. This is really, really bad, you know? You don't try to talk God into it, but... God gives grace when there are thorns in the flesh because he puts them there, right? Brothers and sisters, that's what we do. And we go before God. We proclaim his greatness. We remember his goodness. Look in verse 14 there. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given. We are aliens and pilgrims before you. What's he doing? Acknowledging his, his need and weakness, right? For we are aliens and pilgrims before you. 
as were our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Wow. Wow. But then look what he does. I love this. Verse 16. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build for your house, for your holy name is from your hand and all... By the way, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is a prophecy. I'm getting into this prophecy stuff, all right? Um, whenever God moves us from this place, it'll be God's hand. And we won't have to worry about, is it going to happen? It's going to, if God wants it to happen, what? It's a done deal. All we're trying to figure out is where God wants us to go and how he's going to pay for it. And you notice I said he's going to pay for it? Who, what, what guy in here? I was praying this morning to the Lord. I said, Lord, just do it so great that nobody can have any question about it. Have some guy meet us or come out of his door in the middle of the night and say, I got money for this place. Buy it. It's a million bucks. <laughs> the door opened it. Right? <laughs> Wait a second, Lord. That's a little bit too... What are you doing out at 5 o'clock in the morning, all right? And I said hi, and he didn't say back. He just picked up his newspaper, went back, and said, it's not him, okay? <laughs> but brothers and sisters, God's going to do this, and God's going to do it according to his time plan and according to his will, right? All we have to do is follow after. Does that make sense? Do you get that? So you can see this, and I've got to move on from here, but you can see this all over the place, where God says to men, and men re- respond to the Lord God, we will trust in you because of what you've done. And you can see that in verses 17 and 18. It says where they trust in the Lord that you're going to be able to do that. It presents witness. Worship. I wish I had another, another time just to, to ram these over that it talks about the providence of God and the promises of God. It's, it's the, you know, in verse, in number three there, the acknowledging of a weakness. That draws God's, we- God loves humble people. God loves humble people. He's drawn to them. It's a, as I mentioned last week, it's a character flaw, if you want to call it that. He loves humble people. Last, about two weeks ago, was my mom's 96th birthday. My mom has got dementia. She doesn't really remember who I am unless you tell her, and then she'll forget it a couple of minutes later. But I'm, I'm calling up and wishing her a happy birthday. And Ann says, this is your youngest. This is... This is Willard Jr. That's how I'm known in my family. Willard Jr. My dad's name was Willard. And, oh, honey, how are you? And, and then the, the role goes, and, oh, I miss you. When do I get to see you? And, you know, you explain it again. And before I could say much more, she just said, I want to pray with you. Now, this woman has forgotten most everything in her life. And probably at that moment when she said that, she didn't know how, but she wanted to pray with me. And I look at that and I say, she may have forgotten everything, but not the most important things. We don't know how much longer we're going to live on this earth. We don't know how our lives are going to be. But let's not forget the the important things, the priority things. If you're like me, you have weeks where prayer is really, really good. And then you got other weeks where prayer is really, really bad. Um, in my life, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, you don't got a perfect pastor, okay? You know, don't, don't think that the pastor's got it all together, okay? The pastor is as, as much of a sinner as you are. And there are times where I struggle to get into prayer. I always know Sunday's coming, all right? And that's a real pain at times because you've got to get your act together before Sunday comes, right? If you had to, you guys can slosh through Sunday, you know. Just kidding. But for me, I've got to get ready for Sunday. Sunday's coming. So, and the Holy Spirit starts working on me, and the evil one starts working on me, and there's this battle going on, okay? But that's our responsibility in prayer, to come before God. Um, and I've called you, and, I, and I, 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 I want to reiterate that. Brothers and sisters, I call you to, to feel the burden of where is God leading us? What does God want from us? Because only as we cry out to him is he going to answer. So pray this week again that God would bring us to the harvest and also to a home, whatever that will be in the future. And when we stand there or we we are there, wherever that place is, in the first time when we're there, we're going to sit there and say, look what God has done. Amen? Look what God has done. Now, 
I have just a few minutes left, but I want to go to, uh, back to Second Chronicles chapter 20 and the passage that we looked at this morning. Because the first step, the first step is prayer in a battle. The next one is the, what I put, the prophecy of the sovereignty. Prophecy of sovereignty. And that's really our first pillar of Hope Chapel. Anybody know what our first pillar of Hope Chapel is? What does it say? Proclaim or preaching what? The what? The authority of God's... He, he isn't, he's not going to put it... Now, it's, a, it's a slide. He's not going to put that up until we get through it. All right, so... Because you're all, you're all are looking at me like this. You're going, come on, Brant. Put it up there so I can say something. He's not going to put it up there until we say it, all right? What is it? The preaching of the authority of God's word without apology. The preaching of the authority of God. See, he did it. Preaching of the authority, preaching the authority of God's word without apology. Preaching. That's what, that's what he does now. Because what happens in this situation is that God back then has a guy stand up and says this. Thus says the Lord. Brothers, sisters, first step is prayer. Second step is in the word. Find the scripture. Now, I'm gonna, I want you to listen to me and I want you to listen to me carefully. I am burdened for this church in this area right now. Listen carefully. And my burden is this. When you get in a battle, when you get in a battle, the tendency is to try to fix it yourself and you're forgetting the prayer and the word. Listen carefully. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you are too busy to get into prayer, if you are too busy to get into the word, listen carefully. If you're too busy to go to a life group, you're too busy. You get that? God does not, this is an absolute statement, God does not make you so busy that you can't seek after him. You got that? Now, you may be adding some stuff to the side. You may be saying, I think this is really, really important. It's of, it's of God. God doesn't do that. God says, I give you every single day, I give you in, my, in your life the time for you to study the Scriptures and to pray and to seek my face. Okay? I believe it with all my heart that life group, I believe this with all my heart, that life group is not an option. Why? Because it is in the life group that we grow closer to the Lord. Why? Because I've got four or five guys that are asking me questions every Thursday night. How are you doing, Pastor? What's going on in your life? I need that. That is part of the New Testament. That is not an option. Got that? It's not an option. Well, I'm doing a lot of good stuff. It's not an option for you to just say, well, I can or can't. And I struggle with this myself. It's at my house. I got to go, right? Yeah, I, well, it's in my house, it's always that. But as far as you are concerned, you can say, well, you know, I got other things I got to do. Be careful. Because the answer to the prayer problems that you've been praying about may be answered in that and you're not there. See that? God calls you. God calls you in this. And what happens here is that God said, I've got a word for you to hear. And he brings this guy up here, Jehazael, and he gives the word to the people. The second step in a battle, when the battle comes, remember this. Remember this. When the battle comes, get into the word. Pray, proclaim God's greatness, and remember his goodness, and accept, acknowledge your need, and, and choose to to uh, trust him, but get into the word, get into the word. Are you, are you, let's just apply this right here. Are you in the word on a regular basis, brothers and sisters? Well, you know, maybe once this that week. Don't do that. Don't do that. God wants you in the scriptures. Now, are there days where you're on a plane or you're, you, right, I get that. You can't make it to either a small group or you can't, you know, get to church on that Sunday. There, we have a life. I get that. But on a regular basis, are you in the Scriptures? Do you desire to get into the Scriptures? Because the prophecy here of a sovereign God 
He says, And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in verse 14 and in verse 15. Thus says the Lord. These two phrases show us this next step in the battle. The Word of God. God is speaking and it's the authority of life. It's the absolute truth that's found in the Word of God. I remember when I was a young, young man, an older man said to me one thing that has stuck with me since that time. He looked me and squared in the eye and he said, remember this, you have a life to know God's word. Whether you take it or not is your decision. But you have a life that God has given to you to know the scriptures. Are you doing that, brothers and sisters? Or are you looking, listen carefully, are you looking at the scriptures as an option in your life? It's something I can do. Can I take that away from you and say, reading and studying the scripture is not an option. It is an absolute for the Christian. You get that? It's an absolute. So if you are not reading the scriptures, if you're not studying the scriptures, I will tell you straight up, you're in disobedience. And so am I. Why? Because God calls us to it. God says that this is part of our life. If you're not learning the word of God outside the battle, you will never be led by it inside the battle. If you are not learning the word of God outside the battle, you will never be led by it in the battle. And you'll find yourself on the ground, beaten and broken. And there's two lessons I want to give you very quickly that show up in this passage of Scripture that I want you to see. The first one is simply this, and you can write it down. You can find it all the way through the Old Testament. God owns the battle. Look at that in verse 15. And he said, listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. I mean, I can see it right now. The prophet's probably got his bony finger out there, and he's right at the king. You know, and he's telling the king, listen to me, listen to me, he's saying. Do not be afraid or dismayed because of the great... For the battle is not yours, it's God's. So understand this, and I'm I'm pointing my bony finger at you and saying this. God owns the battle. It's His. It's not yours. The mortgage payment, all of that stuff is not yours. It's His. Get that? It's His battle. You've got to change that in your way of thinking. It's God's battle. It may be your battle to get to work, and to do what you're supposed to be doing and not being lazy. Got that, okay? But it's all God's battle. It's all about Him. And you need to see it that way. The, the battle is the Lord's. It's not yours. So all of the fights that you and I have in our lives that God has, brings us to, you remember Ro- Romans chapter 8 and verses 31 and 37. Write those two passages of Scripture down. Because you can refer to them. It's this. We are more than conquerors, he says, Paul writes. But in Romans chapter 8 and verses 31 and 37, he starts asking a question. If God be for us, what? Yeah. If God is in front of us, who do you got? <laughs> when I was a kid in seventh grade, I was a short, squawny, about two inches younger than I am right now. But I was really, really small. And I was seventh grade and I was playing. I, w- I had to take a PE course in a high school. And everybody was huge. And I was in trouble because they loved to pick on the small, scrawny guy. But for whatever reason, God had a guy by the name of John who took a liking to me. And I was there, and I'll tell you the story, as long as John was there, I was, I was good. And he, was, he wasn't there one time, and these two kids thought they were real smart and told me to walk outside of the bathroom not dressed. I, and I'm not doing that. You know, I just forget that. You know, I had my uns on. They said, get outside. You're, 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 get. no. I, and they said, or oh, you're going to be messed up here. And I knew what that meant. I'm in eighth grade. So I don't know what to say. All of a sudden, <laughs> bless God, made me a Christian like that. John walks around. And John is like six foot four at that, I mean, 290 pound muscle. Yeah, you know I mean, 500 pound, right? Splitting his t-shirt, you know, the whole giggo, you know. He walks around the corner, he says this, Will, you got any problems? He said, Willard. He said, you got any problems? My response was, not any longer. And those guys were like, please don't say anything. I said, see you guys. So they, they walk away. Same thing. When you're in a battle, 
God shows up, what? You don't got any problems. You get that? God owns the battle. God owns the battle. And the second thing, the last thing, you see it in, in, uh, in this passage of Scripture. Verse 17. You will not need to fight in the battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. The second thing is God occupies the battle. Not only does he own it, he's there in it. He occupies it. You know, one thing for there to be a... If I was in that situation with John and he wasn't there, but he was talking over the loudspeaker. I hear that Willard's in trouble with the... uh, Okay, no, no, no. He was right there. And when he turned around the corner, whoa, this is wonderful. I'm loving life now. See, God is there. God owns the battle and he occupies it. God owns the battle and he occupies it. So I'm going to tell you something. When you're in a battle, listen carefully. And you don't sense that the Spirit of God is there or God is with you in the battle. That's not of God. That is of the devil. Got that? And you you and I have to retool here. Because what the devil comes to you and me and says in the battle is this. You're all alone, man. You're all alone. It's over. It's all alone. And you've got to say, that's not truth. That is not truth. And you renew your mind. God owns the battle and he occupies the battle. He's there. And that's what right there. That prophet looked at, looked at uh, King Jehoshaphat and said, just want you to know, and, and, and read the rest of the story. I mean, we'll finish it out next week, but it is just unbelievable what God does in that, in that situation. They walk up over the hill and there is over 100,000 people dead by their own hand. Because God confuses their mind and they start attacking each other. And the Moabites start attacking the people from Mount Seir. And then they start killing each, each other. And they walk up over the mountain. It could have been one person. They walk up over the mountain and it's all over. And God makes this big exclamation point. It's my battle. I'm old enough to now have kids that are doing wonderful things. Okay? <laughs> when they were five-year-olds, and eight-year-olds, I mean, Marie and I were wondering if, God, what did you do? You know, and, it, and it, the day that we found out that she had twins was just, I'll never forget it. We're sitting in the doctor's office, and I hear this, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Marie and I are sitting there, and I think, you have twins. And I'm going, twins? Oh, this is really, really good, Okay. Of course, as a guy, as a dad, what do you, okay? I want to know, two girls, two guys, guy, girl, what, 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 what? And, well, not too sure. Well, that one's definitely a boy. Okay, we've got a boy. Okay, we've got a boy. We've got a boy. And then when he said, uh, and that one's a boy too. I was like, yeah! And my wife was going, oh, God, please. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, okay. I mean, I had twin boys. Well, those twin boys have, have grown up. I'm old enough now to see what they're doing and being proud of it. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If I ever knew my boys or my daughters were in a battle and I was nearby, I could tell you one thing. I would own that battle and I would occupy it. Sorry, Janissa. But my daughter went out with three other teenagers uh, the other night. So we all got in the car and they're getting ready to go. Window comes down. Well, I walk out the front door. Window comes down and I looked at the driver and I said, you have one of my prized possessions in the back seat. Most prized. Okay. You have most prized in the back seat. And then I went from there. They didn't know it, but I had something in the back of my belt. (laughs) I didn't. But I'm saying this. If something had happened, there is nothing that would have kept me from going wherever the problem was. Why? It's my daughter. And a dad 
will do many amazing things when his daughter's life's on the line. You think God's any different with you and me? See, my love for my children is imperfect. My God's love for his children is perfect. They could have driven away and I couldn't have maybe gotten to them because I couldn't get there fast enough or whatever. Got that? But when you're talking about a God who is limitless, he is everywhere, he knows everything, and he's got all power. Are you kidding me? See what I'm saying? The battle is God's. He owns it and he occupies it. And you're in it. Just remember this. Remember this. It's your God. Make it personal. Because he loves you. Let's pray.